my name is uh, Divad Lua. Uh, I'm an android from Mars. And I've been uh, given the task to learn how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So I need someone, I'm a very sophisticated android. I need someone to tell me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Do I have any volunteers? How do I make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? First, you need to go to the store. What's the store? Store is a place where you can buy groceries. What are groceries? Food that you can eat and things that you need to survive with. Oh, food, nourishment, okay. Where is the store located? It depends where you are, but usually there's one around the corner. Around, so if I walked around the corner here, I'd find... Are you home? No, I'm here. Where do you think I am? Okay, well, the nearest mm -hmm. store. Well, let's assume we have all the ingredients in the okay. location where we are. <coughs> First, what do I do? take out a plate. A plate is the thing that you can set your sandwich on and that you can eat off of. A plate? Okay. Where are the plates located? You said that you have all of them. Yeah, I have them all here in the location, but not on the table. Where is the plate located? Well, how am I supposed to know that? It's your house. I mean, your you kitchen. You just said we were here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're in your house and your kitchen. Okay, so above you is a pantry filled with plates. Please grab one of the plates. Okay, we're not here. We're in my house. So stop looking up. <laughs> well, you said above. That's above. Okay, well, if you were in my kitchen, you would be looking at the cabinets above you, and I just told you to open the pantry. <laughs> oh, you, you never look away from your cabinets? You're always looking at your cabinets in your kitchen? And your kitchen sink, do you have cabinets above the kitchen I sink? Do. And is that where I'm looking? No, you're standing at the counter. I'm going to continue. So, so I get a plate. Yes. You describe what a plate is very okay. nicely. And then you open the bag of bread. No okay. <laughs> okay. told me to open the bread. You didn't even okay, tell gently. me to get the bread, but I assumed you, I got the bread, and then you told me to open <laughs> Okay, gently open the bag of bread and take two slices of bread out of the bag, and then close the bag. Well, I just ripped it open. I just did it gently. Um, okay. Explain how I open up a bag of bread. Take the twist tie off of the bag of bread gently. Okay. Put the twist tie down. Do I, do I get the twist tie off clockwise or counterclockwise? It doesn't matter, I don't think. It depends. Well, it depends how it's closed. It's okay. closed However clockwise. However, the is closed, please go in the okay. opposite I'll, I'll direction. Okay, I'll open it. Okay, now, so now I take... Two pieces of okay. bread. Okay, so I take the two end pieces. Oh, my God. <laughs> I did what you told me to. No, you didn't. You said take two pieces of bread. Okay, take two pieces from the front of the loaf. Okay, so place. one end piece and the next piece. Sure. Yes. Okay. And now then what? place them carefully on the plate next to you. The plate. Put them on the plate. Okay. Okay. Now lift your hands off of the bread and close the bag. No, no, this is the bread on the plate. Okay. Now, in the drawer to your left, Please open it, and you will find a knife in there. Please wrap the knife out. How do I know what a knife looks like? I'm an android from Mars, remember? <laughs> Maybe you should demonstrate first how to do it, and then how to do it. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Okay. What does a knife look like? So, it's an object without any spikes at the top of it, or rounded. It. It's long and flat. Okay, the only thing that we need, I got it, okay. Okay. Now, put the knife down on the counter, next to the sand. Go to the cabinet that is directly behind you, and open it up. <laughs> okay, look for the peanut butter, the peanut butter. I just ripped the doors off the cabinet. Oh, you know? <laughs> gently open my cabinet up. You have to describe gently in language that, uh, Android can understand how much tensile strength, but we'll, we'll forget that for the moment. Oh, will we? Okay. With minimal force. So in front of you, there's going to be honey, peanut 
peanut butter, and a few other condiments. Please grab the peanut butter. It says, do you know how to read? Yes. Okay. It, it says Jiffy peanut butter on it. Please grab that out. Okay, now, turn around. Gently put it down on the countertop. Turn back around. Gently close my cabinet doors. Thank you. Now turn back around. Okay, now open, grab the jar of peanut butter gently. Take the jar of peanut butter and put your hand on the lid. Twist it in the opposite direction, you know, counterclockwise, I believe. Is that going to open? Yeah. yeah. Okay, until the peanut butter is open. Now, please place the lid on the counter, gently. Okay, put the peanut butter down on the counter, gently. Yeah, I got the appropriate tensile strength. <laughs> okay, please grab the butter knife, the knife, gently. Okay, now, with your other hand, please pick up the jar of peanut butter. Now, take the butter knife and put it into the jar gently, and just scrape a little bit out of the jar. A little bit of peanut butter out of the Well, jar. I got the knife at the bottom of the jar. How do I get a little out? Just pull it out. Just pull the <laughs> knife out. Okay, you should have peanut butter on it. <coughs> put, the, put the jar of peanut butter down, gently. Okay, now put your arm at a normal length. Put your arm down a little. Just a little. Okay, now pick up a slice of bread off of the plate. It doesn't matter which piece, just pick up a slice of bread. Gently. Okay, now, take your butter knife that now has peanut butter on it and start to smear it on the slice of bread gently. Back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. Okay. Sure. <laughs> All right. Now, getting the point, it is so hard, it is so hard to write code for a robot to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. As a matter of fact, it's almost impossible. Almost impossible. It's the same thing as if I say to a child, Go into the closet, my closet, and get my boots. And the kid comes with a left boot and a right boot that don't match. And I hold one boot in my hand and I say, get me the other one. He goes back and brings the right one out. Do you know what it takes to program a computer to do that, a robot? It has to understand what the word another means. It also has to understand the whole layout of the house. It has to have all the GPS points in the house. You've got to make sure there's nothing in its way, but any three or four year old kid can do it. Computers cannot think. Computers cannot think. I don't care how fast they process. Look what's going on to make something as simple as making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. The code is so enormous, so absolutely enormous. Uh, it's like if I said to, a, if I tried to program a computer to bring me a pack of cigarettes from my kitchen, think about what goes into it. First of all, it has to know what my cigarettes are. So I have to give a detailed description in code, in zeros and ones, what a pack of my cigarettes look. I have to make it understand its own tensile strength. That means how much pressure to put on the pack of cigarettes to bring it. It has to have a diagram of the whole house with all the GPS. And if it isn't where I said it is, it's dead. It can't do anything else. But if I send you into the kitchen to find a pack of cigarettes and it isn't where I said it is, what would you do? She'd start looking around. You'd even open up cabinets. So you have to dispel yourself of the notion that computers can think. They can't. The other thing is, <coughs> are computers ever motivated to do anything? No. <coughs> can a computer paint the Mona Lisa? Well, give it enough time and enough instructions? Probably. Does it have a desire to create the Mona Lisa? No. no. 
It just sits there waiting for you to tell it what to do. Unlike people who do things because they have motivation. And that's part of what some people want to argue is our consciousness. I'm going to show you some film of uh, some other philosophers talking about mind and body and consciousness, <coughs> the whole spiel. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting uh, class today. What's the title of the presentation? Oh, he did it. He did it wrong. There is no mind-body problem, or what mind-body problem? Did he ever solve it? No. He said we have to look at it differently. That's number one. Number two, at the very end he talks about empathy. He talks about, I have a certain kind of understanding of what's going on in your mind. What does that mean? understand what it is to be sad. You can't have my sadness, but you understand sadness. That's empathy. And empathy is the beginning of morality. Now, I for a long time used to argue that uh, our sense of right and wrong morality is something we're born with. You're born with goodie bags and baggy bags. They're empty, but you know some things are good and some things are bad, and you are taught what to put in the goodie bag and what to put in the Bad back. I believe that your conscious is genetic. And of course I have no proof for that until recently. They've done some experiments with rats. They put a rat in a plastic box that's closed. And they put a rat in the same room that's free to roam around. And what do you think the first thing the free roaming rat did? And did what? Well, there's a sliding door on the, the box. What does he do? Try to open the box. Opens the box. To set the other rat free. Somehow or other, the free rat knew there was something impeding the rat in the box. And he opened it. Okay, no big deal. It, was, it didn't cost him anything to open it. Same scenario. Rat in the box, in the sliding door, a rat free roaming, and there are five <clears throat> M&Ms. In, in a single sitting, most of these rats eat five M&Ms. You know what this rat did? Opened up the cage and gave two to the other rat and ate three. That's empathy. There are other experiments that happen without people even realizing it. They have a free roaming bonobo, it's a type of chimpanzee in a room with her favorite food. And there's a bonobo in a cage that she's never met. They don't know each other. She opens the cage and shares her food with the other bonobo. That's morality. Now, that has to come from something deep-seated 
in the animals. To reduce that to brain and eliminate mind seems a far stretch. We're going to look at another. Oh, by the way, were you getting bored with this guy? No, this guy didn't bore you? Oh, okay, good. Phoenix is gorgeous. Warm weather, blue skies, the Sonoran Desert, and what's bet? You should recognize one of the things he said when he says that consciousness is the result of an underlying lower level set of actions. And he talked about the firing of, of the neurons. When we looked at the pre-Socratics, one of them said, all change in quality is a result of change in quantity. When the brain reaches a certain level and the complexity of the neural patterns reaches a certain level, it gives rise to a different quality. What's that quality in this case? It goes from physical to, to immaterial, the mind. something that wasn't even there. You follow? One more. I am not going to play this whole thing. It's way too long. Or maybe not, if you're interested in it. Remember, Searle says, I think about raising my arm when I raise I my arm. I know everybody knows a lot about the double slit experiment, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. If you take uh, elementary particles, quanta, photons, <clears throat> electrons, and so on, you send them through two slits, and you look at a screen to, to see what happens. If you don't know which of the two slits the particle went through, then you get an interference pattern. And this, of course, works just as well if you're sending a single photon or single electron at one time. The mystery is that as soon as you do know, by any means, which of the two slits the particle goes through, then you get a, a pattern that looks like its particles. This is, of course, leads to the famous wave-particle duality. And, and a much more pr 
practical sense, it leads to this sort of thing. The caption says, it says the cost of the flight went up because we acknowledged its existence. <laughs> so there's something peculiar about observation. And this is, of course, the quantum measurement problem, which you can has been described before here, but I'm going to do it in a simpler form. You have some sort of a system, which could be a double slit, any kind of physical system, some sort of measuring apparatus, and the measuring apparatus does an observation of the system. From a, a quantum perspective, you take the tensor product between the two quantum systems, the two physical systems, and you end up with a system and the measurement apparatus no longer being independent. So we can say that the two physical systems are entangled. So from a quantum perspective, we're just dealing with complex waves. There's, there's no particle-like behavior yet. John Bell made this sketch to illustrate the problem. Well, where does the measurement end? So if you imagine that you have a photon, and it goes through two slits, and it hits a screen, you might have a photodetector, and then you might have a human uh, a counter that looks at the number of times that the photodetector goes off, and then the human eye and the human brain. All of those are physical systems, all of them that are therefore quantum, well, why do we see particles? Why does observation make a difference? So this is sometimes called the, uh, the von Neumann chain or the Heisenberg chain. Where is the cut made? When does quantum become classical? John von Neumann said that the measurement chain ends only when knowledge of the measurement is registered by what he called an extra physical factor. In other words, you, you can't use another physical system to end the chain because it just becomes more quantum. So you need something extra physical by which he meant consciousness. And he wasn't alone in his opinion. Almost all of the founders of quantum mechanics said something like this in various ways, but go all the way back to Bohr and, and even Planck. They all said something like this, and this continues to the present day, as you know. This is uh, today a minority opinion within physics, but nevertheless, it has a pretty prominent uh, background. So I've been aware of this, of course, and everyone offers theories about consciousness, but nobody does anything about it when it comes to this particular problem, the measurement problem. So what we did in, in the laboratory is we, we built a double slit system, and fortunately it's a very simple type of a system. You have a laser, you have a filter, you have a double slit, and you have a camera that looks at the result. So the only new element in this experiment is that we ask people, in this case like a meditator, to keep the double slit in mind and to imagine in their mind's eye that they could see which of the two slits that the photon went through. Uh, this is, as, we could, as far as we could tell, the only way of directly testing whether consciousness is actually collapsing the wave function. So this is what the apparatus looks like. The tube sticking out of the long box there is the, the far end of the helium neon laser and the, the, the uh, double slit and the camera are inside the box, so it's a sealed system. You can't see it with your eye, you can only use your mind's eye. This is the camera, it's called a line camera, and this particular one is 3,000 pixels long in a line. And what the camera sees is an alternating band of light and dark. This is the interference pattern. Uh, when you look at this in software, you can say, well, how bright is each band? And you get a picture that looks something like that. Is that your one? Yeah. <clears throat> so you get this sort of Gaussian-looking shape, and that's the way of looking at the interference. So if we start with that pattern in, in uh, picture A, you can do a Fourier transform, which is picture B, and the peak in the middle is now the double-slit spectral power. And this is the way we initially started doing these experiments, with looking at the power spectrum. And this is convenient because, again, we asked someone who, in this case, in the laboratory, is two meters away from the sealed optical system. We asked them to keep the double slit in mind. And then the measurement is very simple. We predict that if observation is doing something to the interference pattern, that the double slit component of that interference will go away. Or at least it'll go down. In addition, because this is an abstract task, the, the double slit itself is about, uh, each slit is 10 microns across. And if you simply hold up the double slit to somebody to, to have them look at it, they may or may not even be able to see it. So it's difficult for some people to imagine that they can, in their mind's eye, see what's going on in that space. 
So we do a real-time analysis of the, of the double slit power, and we use that to adjust uh, feedback tone. So if you have somebody doing a task, they could look at a screen, which is showing a signal, or they can simply do it by listening to the tone. And generally what we do is we have like a, a droning tone, and we ask the person to make the droning tone louder, make it just louder because it's a very pleasant tone, and then uh, that if they would know that they were succeeding through that tone. This also provides a way to, to focus their mind on the task at hand, because mind wandering is always a big problem. The protocol is very simple as well. We compare the double slit power during mental observation versus no observation. We get a, a voice message which says, now concentrate, and then now relax, and this alternates. We do the observation periods for 30 seconds, and the rest periods are 30 seconds, plus or minus a random 5 seconds, for reasons I'll mention later. This is repeated in a typical session 40 times. So the whole session lasts 20 minutes. And the measure that we're interested in is a differential measure. We're asking what is the double slit power while observing versus while resting. So that it, and there are many ways of doing the statistics. We, generally presented in terms of a z-score, or an effect size. So we did our first experiment in this form. Uh, this was for 35 sessions, 20 minutes apiece, 15 people contributed it. Overall, you can see the, the mean and one standard error. We did actually pretty good. The meditators did a little bit better than the non-meditators. And uh, the prediction was that the doubles of the power would drop during observation, and indeed that's what we saw. So when we do experiments of this type, especially when they work the first time, we're always suspicious about the first timer's effect, or that everybody's very enthusiastic about what's going on. Uh, so we, we repeat it again and again. So we did. Everyone understands what he's doing, right? The double slit experiment <clears throat> shows a wave pattern. Okay? You have someone six feet away concentrating on the double slits. We know from other experiments, if you put a photon counter to count or observe which slit the protons come through, you get a different pattern. You get two bars, okay? In the wave, you got this thing in the center really high peaked. So this guy's sitting six feet, six feet away, that's two meters, a little over six feet. And he's concentrating on a double slit as though he could see an ad, uh, a photon go through one slit or the other. And that's enhanced by the tone, so he can concentrate, right? Biofeedback. If consciousness exists, it should act like a photon detector and change the pattern of the graph. And in this case, that that peak should go down. And that's what happened. So, so their prediction that just thinking about the photons going through the slits alters the pattern that they go through, which means something non-physical is affecting something physical, the photons. Now, this could be just an anomaly. So you have to do other experiments. Did four pilot studies each time adjusting things in various ways and uh, looking at different kinds of aspects of, uh, of the design. And in each case, each one of the four pilot studies, the meditators did quite well. Uh, if you just combine everybody, the green dots are the overall result. And in some of the experiments, the non-meditators did not do very well. Uh, they tend to mind wander pretty quickly. So there's a, as you remember, there's a 30 second period where you're asked to do this abstract task of putting your mind in a box at a distance. And they can do that for about four seconds, and then they can't do it anymore. So the overall result of the pilot studies was this. Uh, you see, again, overall, it got a pretty nice effect. Uh, meditators did quite well. Non-meditators overall got actually close to chance. And we ran the same system. And this, by the way, was 250 20-minute sessions, 137 people. And we ran the same system again and again. Uh, as controls, which are the white dots, and we don't see any any uh, artifacts within the hardware or software or analytics uh, that would suggest that there's some kind of bias in the system. So uh, here it looks like observation was collapsing the wave function, at least the meditators could do that. And the control tests, we don't see any effect. 
So we were encouraged by this to go ahead and do a formal experiment, formal in the sense that we pre-specified how many sessions we would do in advance, so 50 sessions. So here's the result of the, the 50 session pre-planned experiment using the same analysis that we had used in the previous experiments. And this gave us a five sigma result. So for those of you who are not used to the term sigma, it's, think of it in terms of z-score. It's the same thing, standard normal deviant. So we got a five sigma result uh, when people were observing and when nobody was doing the observing, we got almost exactly chance. Uh, when we do an experiment like that, we get a very strong result. If you keep in mind that a five sigma result was able to give uh, CERN the Nobel Prize for finding the Higgs, Higgs particle, which turned out not to be Higgs after all. Uh, well, we got a five sigma result too, but I haven't heard from the Nobel Prize Committee yet. And, and even, it, and we were also suspicious of it because that seemed way too good. So we did a, another formal experiment. Again, 50 sessions, we did other things that I don't have time to talk about in this. But one of the things I'm showing here now is this is the control results, uh, and it's lagged in time. And the reason why we look at the results lagged in time is because if you ask somebody to now concentrate, and then a little while later, now relax you can't switch your mind instantaneously. So we expect that there should be a delay in the, in the results of the experiment because it takes mind, the mind to switch gears. So this provides actually a nice secondary way of, of looking for the results that we hope to find because if there is no delay, then you have to be suspicious about the results. So here's, the, so here's time zero, which is when the instruction is given to switch your attention. There's the experimental results with the lag from 0 to 15 seconds, and in fact, we got a slightly better result with two-second delay. So I'm not going to talk about this analysis again for the re remainder of the experiments, but we did this sort of lag analysis in all of the studies that we've done. So after doing the second formal experiment, again getting over a five-sigma result, uh, we got suspicious. So maybe this was caused simply by proximity of the human body even though it's two meters away from the, the double set system, we figured that maybe when somebody's asked to concentrate, they lean forward slightly. And for those of you who've worked with interferometers, you know that they're exquisitely sensitive to everything. So we, we thought maybe the temperature change from a body one inch closer versus one inch away would be sufficient to make this result. So we decided to put the entire thing on the internet so we'd be sure that we could rigorously separate people by distance. So there's the double slip. This is sitting on a rack that has a bunch of servers on it. Uh, and we, we ran this uh, for three solid years, calendar years 2012, 13, and 14. Ended up with over 5,000 sessions done by human observers and 7,000 done by robot observers. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. So when somebody would sign on to our website, this was a public site, by the way, we got people from around the world to do this, in a non-observing condition, what you would see is this blue rectangle on the browser screen and simply saying, please relax. And you'd hear no sound. And then it would switch. You'd hear a voice saying, now please concentrate. And then you would start seeing this line move along the screen. The instructions were to make the blind go up. Now you understand, the people are no longer in the room with the apparatus. They're on the internet. <clears throat> Concentrating on the double split or relaxing, not observing the double split. Got it? And you would hear a kind of a whistling, a whistling sound that was a tone, and you were, the, the tone would go up and down as the line went up and down. And we did that so, again, you could do this experiment with your eyes closed. Now, there are also lots of checks and balances built in here. We knew, for example, if somebody left the experiment while it was going, and we would then mark, we'd restore all the data, but we'd mark it as. This was an experiment that, uh, that was not completed by a person. For the what we call the robot experiment, it was a Linux system which was designed to simulate a human. Now, the beauty of this is that the, everything was exactly the same as far as the double slit system was concerned because it didn't know, we think, it didn't know whether a human was looking at it or a Linux system because they both came through the internet in the same way. So we have very nice control for human observation versus we don't know whether a Linux system is conscious or not, but if it is, it probably doesn't have the same level of consciousness as a human. So here's the interference pattern. 
Now, this is a, the central portion of the interference pattern that the camera would see. What we did, and this was a simpler measure than we did before, and this is called fringe visibility, which looks at, the, at a peak and a trough, and it measures the relative difference between the two. And this is nice because if, if you work with lasers, you know that they, they're not in, amazingly stable. Some of them are more stable than others. We were using a helium neon gas laser, which is known to do things like mode hopping. Power levels will slightly change. And you have to jump through some statistical hoops in order to reduce the effect of that mode hopping. But for fringe visibility, you don't need to worry about that so much because this is now a relative measure and takes into account that there may be fluctuations in power. So it's a more sensitive measure as well. So the prediction is fringe visibility while you're observing would go down. So it's somewhat similar to expect, expectation that doubles the power would go down. In this case, it's fringe visibility. So this is the result of the sessions in 2012. There are 2,303 sessions done by the Linux system. Uh, these are the middle 20 fringes of the interference pattern. And it shows in terms of z-scores where it was. There's one or two of them that were around 3 sigma. Uh, but overall, it was pretty close to chance. And this is what we got with human observers. So some, again, approached 5 sigma differences. Uh, that was 2,089 sessions by 600. And 89 people around the world. So, what's when the robots were observing? The result would be the same as chance. When the humans are observing, everything is below the line, which means they are affecting the double slit experiment. Not even in the same room. Their consciousness over space is affecting the results. What's nice here is they're able to look at yet another issue, which is does distance matter? So this is the distribution of the effect sizes from where we were in California to the farthest that you can get from our laboratory, which is South Africa, which is 18,000 kilometers away. And so we did a, a, a linear regression and it turned out to be flat to six decimal places. But not null. It actually, that line looks like it points at zero, but it's below zero. That's how, why we ended up with a significant effect. So the observer effect is independent of distance. We then, uh, again, in every case when we do an experiment and get a result like that, we don't believe it ourselves and have to replicate it just to convince ourselves that it's real. So we did it again the calendar year 2013 and 2014. Uh, so here are 5,700 sessions of the controls. So this is now a cumulative deviation plot. So cumulatively, you should expect that the deviations that you see in, in this experiment should sort of hover around zero. There shouldn't be any systematic deviation, and there, there isn't. There's a slight positive movement in the 2013 data, but not in 2014. This is the controls. Then we look at the experimental results. So in 2013, we got a, a cumulative uh, march towards fringe dropping, fringe visibility dropping, which is what we had seen before and what we had predicted. But 2014, it just kept getting more and more positive. And this was a big puzzle. Um, we, as far as we could tell, uh, the system was the same. It, it's turned on and has left on for the entire year, it's never turned off. The program is the same, everything was the same, and when you do the statistics on it, sure enough, it completely reverses. So this was a big puzzle. It took about a month for me to figure out what was happening here. And the, the reason why it reversed is this, that when you think about a conventional coordinate system, because remember that the way that we present the feedback here is a, a, a squiggly line that moves on a graph.
that something is affecting the results of the double slit experiment that isn't physical. So what would you conclude from that? It's all conch, uh, conscious. Human consciousness changes the behavior of physical things at a distance. At a distance. If you want to know the answer to your question, you want to listen to it, just go to Google and Google uh, double split experiments and consciousness and, and you'll find it. So here we've seen three things. We've seen one person who argues that there really isn't a mind-body problem because it has to do with empathy that I can feel what you feel to a certain extent. I'm predisposed to know what's going on in your head, not to the extent that you are. Searle says consciousness is real and gives you all the reasons why it's, it's absolutely real. And here we have physical evidence that it's real. Now we're going to look at someone who says, absolutely not. Phoenix is gorgeous. Warm weather, blue skies, the Sonoran Desert. Uh, I want better than doing something amazing in my city. Your last name. Doing it for free. Hey, we hear you. Most people think consciousness, whatever it is, is just supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. It's something so wonderful, 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 wonderful that, that we have to sort of divide the universe in two to make room for it, all on one side, all by itself. And I understand why they think that, and I think it's just wrong. It is wonderful. It's astonishingly wonderful, but it is not a miracle, and it isn't magic. It's a bunch of tricks. And uh, it really is, I like the comparison with magic because uh, stage magic, of course, is not magic magic, it's a bunch of tricks. And consciousness is a bunch of tricks in the brain. Uh, and we're learning what those tricks are and how they fit together, and why it seems to be so much more than that bunch of tricks. Uh, now, for a lot of people, the very suggestion that that might be so is offensive or repugnant. They really don't like that idea. And uh, they view it as an assault, sort of an assault on their dignity or their specialness. And I think that's a, a, a prime mistake. It's a mistake because it means if you think that way, you're going to systematically ignore the paths of exploration, of research, that, that might tend to confirm that. And you're going to hold out for mystery. You're going to hold out for more specialness than is really there. And some people just can't help themselves. They, 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 they can't take seriously, they won't take seriously, the idea that consciousness is a, an amazing collection of, of sort of mundane tricks in the brain. And they say, oh, I just can't imagine it. And I say, no, you won't imagine it. You can imagine it, you're just not trying. I think, I think the, the hidden agenda, and not so hidden very often for all of this, is concern about free will. I think that at, at the bottom of the barrel, what people are really worried about is that if we have an entirely naturalistic and ultimately in a certain sense mechanistic at the, at the nano level, at the, at the protein level, if we have a mechanistic theory of consciousness, this will show that, oh my gosh, we don't have free will and then life has no meaning and and I can't be responsible for my uh, best or worst deeds. And that doesn't follow. But uh, fear that it would follow rattles people and deflects them 
from taking these ideas seriously because they really don't want them to be true. My approach to that is to challenge that desire and say, no, everything you want or should want in the way of free will, you can have on this picture. You, there's some traditional notions of free will that turn out to be impossible on this view. Tough. But why do you want them? They're not important. They are, they are uh, simply ill-founded desires. The varieties of free will worth wanting, you can have. Uh, and so, take a deep breath, relax, and let's figure out how it's going. For billions of years on this planet, there was life, but no free will. Physics hasn't changed, but now we have free will. The difference is not in physics, it has nothing to do with determinism or indeterminism. It has to do with ultimately with biology, particularly evolutionary biology. What has happened over those billions of years is that greater and greater competences have been designed and have evolved. And the competence of a, of a, of a dolphin or of a chimpanzee, uh, the cognitive competence, the, the sort of mental competence, is hugely superior to uh, the competence of, you know, a lobster or a starfish. Uh, but ours dwarfs the competence of a dolphin or a chimpanzee, uh, perhaps even greater extent. And there's an entirely naturalistic story to say, to tell, about how we came to have that competence, or those competences. And it's that can-do, it's that, it's that power that we have, which is natural, but it's that power which sets us aside from every other species. And the key to it is that we don't just act for reasons, we represent our reasons to ourselves and to others. The business of asking somebody, why, why did you do that? And the person being able to answer is it's a very simple and very, it's an everyday phenomenon, but it is the key. And it, it is the key to responsibility. And in fact, the word responsibility sort of wears its meaning on its sleeve. We are responsible because we can respond to challenges to our reasons. Why? Because we don't just act for reasons, we act for reasons that we consciously represent to ourselves. And this is what gives us the power and the obligation to think ahead to anticipate, to see the consequences of our action, to be able to evaluate those consequences in the light of what other people tell us, to share our wisdom with each other. No other species can do anything like it. And it's because we can share our wisdom that we have a special responsibility. It's, uh, as the old tag would have it, it's noblesse oblige. We have the power, and that's what gives us the obligation. And that's what makes us free in a way that no bird is free, for instance. Yeah, just a quick comment. This responsibility that he talks about. Can you give it another name? In the context of what we're talking about today. Can you think of another name for his notion of responsibility? In context of what we're talking about today. Consciousness. Consciousness! He's just giving it a different name. And he has the same description of how, con how responsibility comes about. Through the quantitative changes in our brain that Searle gives for the development of consciousness. Somehow or other, and I love Ned, don't get me wrong, uh, he hates the word consciousness. He'll use every other word in the book. What's the difference between responsibility and being conscious of your actions? We'll talk some more about this on uh, Thursday.